How you doing folks? And in this video I'm going to be talking about EVP recordings and the scan radio or spirit box. Within the Fortean field, the study of anomalous phenomena, there are those who specialize in specifically spirits, hauntings, or ghost activity, poltergeist. Within this branch of the study of anomalous phenomena, people start to use audio recorders for trying to detect what they call electronic voice phenomena. Now at first, what people used was tape recorders or tape decks. The idea was that spiritual beings or spiritual forces could leave an electromagnetic impression on a cassette tape. The people would record cassette tapes and they would ask questions and then they'd play it back, they'd listen closely, and they'd hear an anomalous voice that they could try to interpret, and that's where we get this EVP. The original idea heavily had to do with the fact that it was a tape. The whole idea of it imprinting some kind of electromagnetic frequency onto the tape itself was very much a part of the theory. But as time moved on and technology advanced, people started using digital recorders. And so they would use these digital recorders and still pick up what they call EVPs. So what are EVPs? Well, well, believers in this theory would say that they are voices from beyond that are electromagnetically or electronically manipulating the technology to have those voices come through, to send a message. My personal idea of what this is, is that it is simple interpretation of static. Especially with those old tape decks, they make a lot of noise, and this background noise could be interpreted as voices, words, or messages. This is what's called pareidolia. I think this kind of audio pareidolia and background noise is what can account for most EVPs. Now there are some that sound very clear, very deliberate, and those could be mysterious. Sure, I'm open to that. Some of them, however, are deliberately faked, because you could easily go back and change things, add things, and uh, put in a voice that wasn't there to begin with. So some of them are fake, some of them are misidentifications, and some of them, I'm open to the idea, are genuinely some kind of anomalous thing. But I say that most of them are interpreting static. And this goes back to ideas of divination, where people would interpret tea leaves or throw bones on the ground and interpret where they lay. Divination often has to do with interpreting random elements, shuffling the tarot cards, looking up to the sky, seeing the clouds, and interpreting their meaning. To me, this is audio divination. This is a digital form of divination. You're interpreting background noise and static into a message. Oftentimes, though, it should be said, when you record EVPs, you hit the button, you ask the question, is anyone there? Is there any message? What, what do you have to say? Oftentimes, you'll get no response back at all. So, which is about what you would expect. Sometimes, you'll get something. And like I said, this could be accounted for by background noise, or the noise of the recorder. In fact, some paranormal investigators like to use really old audio recorders, really staticky sounding, low quality audio. Some of them will go into their editors and boost the background noise incredibly high. And when they do that, there is distortion and there is a lot of background noise that's now there. You're kind of refining the background noise to make it louder. And so you'll hear more things that sound uh, like a response to your question. Confirmation bias certainly plays in as well. Because when you ask, is anyone there, and you hear something that sounds kind of like a yes, you might take that as a definite yes, because you want that. That's the confirmation bias creeping in. That's the pareidolia, when you hear a noise in the distance and it sounds kind of like your name, so you interpret it as that must have been someone saying your name. It's kind of like listening to the noise of a washing machine or a uh, an air conditioner or something like that, and slowly trying to interpret the noises. In fact, famous contactee and pulp fiction author Richard Schaefer, he had a job as a welder, and he said he would hear voices in the welding machine as he was welding. And of course he wrote those great stories about the, the Deros who live underground and all that sort of thing in his, in his works published by Ray Palmer. You can look into that, the story is called I remember Lemira, and it is a, a big part of the Schaefer mystery. 
So I think most EVP can be explained by pareidolia, background noise, and the interpretation of static like divination. And I would say divination is a valid form of spiritual communication. People use divination in spiritual ways. So it makes perfect sense that you could do an audio recording and then interpret the noise. That's perfectly valid as a spiritual practice. But to say that it was a manipulation of the device, I think is inaccurate. It's perfectly valid to interpret random elements of the universe into an answer to your questions. People have been doing that for centuries. That's divination. So if you want to record EVPs and say, this is an answer to my question, I'm interpreting this as an answer to my question, that's perfectly valid. That's cool. That's a spiritual practice. Now, if you start saying that's scientific, if you start saying that this was somehow a manipulation of the device itself, I would say that's inaccurate. There are some cases where a person will hear a noise in the room, and that is different from an EVP. That is not an electronic voice phenomena, that is an acoustic phenomena. In some cases, people will hear these noises and it won't pick up on the recorder. In some cases, people will hear these noises and it will pick up on the recorder. That to me sounds like it's more of an actual acoustic noise in the room. The one that's not picked up might be something uh, in your mind that you heard that is you know, not recorded. So the idea that electromagnetism is involved is something that is both present in the ghost and haunting branch of anomalous phenomena and in the UFO branch of anomalous phenomena because UFO fans also think that UFOs have some kind of electromagnetic phenomena involved. And EMF meters are used in haunted houses the same way they are used to detect UFOs with UFO detectors. They both detect electromagnetic frequency. So it would seem that the fans of poltergeists and the fans of UFOs both agree that whatever phenomena we're dealing with is electromagnetic in nature. And if the phenomena we're dealing with is electromagnetic, then surely it could manipulate tapes or even manipulate a digital device. In fact, many witnesses of the paranormal will say that there are cameras, the batteries suddenly start to drain, or the camera stops working altogether. And this is not just people interested in spirits, but people interested in monsters, Sasquatch, UFOs, what have you. So I see why people would conclude that the voices on the recorder must be some kind of manipulation in an electromagnetic way. But I really don't think that's what's happening with the EVP. I think that it's static divination. I think that it is digital audio divination. I think you could do this with anything, including even a radio. In 2002, there was a man named Frank Sumpton. He noticed that people were using white noise generators to aid in EVP recording. So people would be doing EVP recording, asking their questions, and in the background, they would have some device that made background noise for them. White noise. No actual syllables coming through, just white noise. And you could do that with a radio tuned to a station that has nothing on it. So Frank Sumpton decided to make his own radio, which he called the Frank Box. The Frank Box was set up so that it would tune to random stations, some of which had nothing on them, some of which had something on them. And it would scan so quickly, jumping around randomly, that you were able to hear slight snippets, slight syllables, parts of words, and even a full word if it was a quick one. And it would go around these different stations, and as he listened to this radio, he would hear words, he would hear responses and he would ask questions, and he'd get answers. And this is very similar to EVP, but it's a little bit different, because this is a radio. This isn't just standing in a room and asking questions into a recorder. This isn't some electromagnetic frequency manipulating a tape or a device. It would have to be manipulating the radio if that was the case. But as I think, he's just scanning through radio stations and picking up pieces and interpreting them like divination, like tea leaves, like clouds, like growing bones, like any other kind of divination that requires randomness. As he's listening to the radio, it's like shuffling a tarot card, and he pulls out the card, and he looks at the card, and he sees meaning within it, the same as you would do when you shuffle through stations on the radio. You stand through the frequencies, you hear a word, that word has meaning, but happen to say yes right when you asked a question. You happen to say some word that sounds maybe like your name, and that's what I think this concept is that this device was doing. So who was Frank talking to? when he was asking the radio questions. Well, since EVP recorders are typically done to do with spirits, spiritual beings, poltergeists, you might assume he was talking to the spirits. He thought he was talking to aliens. So, that kind of throws a, a curveball there for you. Frank thought he was talking to aliens, and that aliens were hijacking into the frequency and delivering messages to him. 
and they called him purple. Not sure what that's all about. I think he was saying that they were purple, and that he, they were accepting him as purple. I don't know. Something about purple. So as a fan of UFOs, I think that's pretty cool. And once again, shows the crossover between these two different branches of the same study of the Fordian field. Both UFO fans and spirit fans both agree there's electromagnetic frequency involved, and they both agree that these things can communicate through radio waves. There are UFO cases, contactees, where people would scan through radios, they would go between the stations and they would hear words, and there are examples of UFO contactees, UFO witnesses, doing that to communicate with the beings who pilot those flying saucers we see in the sky. So there are examples of people believing that and doing that already. So Frank Sumpton only gave out his Frank boxes to friends that he thought should have them. He didn't really distribute them, he didn't sell them, he just had them. And another thing happened in Frank's life, which I think changed the way the Frank box would be seen. Uh, with the death of his son, he started using the Frank box to communicate with him. And this is where it takes a turn more for the spiritual than the alien. So Frank never sold his Frank box, but he showed it off. So when showing off the Frank box, people were seeing that this man was supposedly communicating with not only aliens, but spiritual beings, spiritual forces, and ghosts. So it makes sense, especially in the early 2000s, when TV stations were littered with these terrible ghost shows, that people would want to use that same device, but they don't have the know-how to make a device that randomly picks through stations the way the Frank Box did. And so, of course, the ever-wise ghost TV shows decided to do something else much more simple. They took a radio from a radio shack. They opened the radio, took certain pins out, and then put it back together. And when they hit scan, instead of just scanning to a station, it scanned continuously. You were able to scan from one station all the way through to the end of the stations and then back again. This is not what the Frank Box did. The Frank Box randomly skipped around, but this radio, which they called the Shack Hack, because it's a hacked version of a Radio Shack radio, this version scanned linearly through the stations. So it would scan from one end of the frequency all the way to the end and then back again. So you're scanning for a few seconds through each station. There was no way to control the scan, there was no way to, you know, slow it down, speed it up. It just scanned linearly through all the stations over and over again. And this was used on those horrible green night vision ghost shows that people love so much. But you'll notice they didn't call the Frank box. Most people watching had no idea of the connection from this to Frank something. Eventually the shack hack became known as a ghost box or a spirit box. Some people prefer to call it a broken radio. I myself affectionately called it a broken radio at one point, but I do have to say that that's not semantically accurate, because though the radio may have been modified, it still works, it's not broken, and the task that it's doing, while that task is not the original intended task, scanning through frequencies, is still a functional task. It's doing something new. And what is that task? Scanning. It's a scan radio. That's what it is. So, instead of calling it a broken radio, I think it's more accurately to call it a scan radio. But the TV shows don't like to call it a scan radio. Most ghost fans don't like to call it a scan radio, because they want to call it a spirit box, which takes away the fact that it's a radio. They don't call it a spirit radio, they don't call it a ghost radio. They call it a spirit box, because removing the idea that it's a radio that's scanning through frequencies makes it sound more like it's messages straight from beyond. Some people would take the shack hack and remove the antenna on it. Now some radios can still pick up frequencies even when the antenna is broken off, even when the antenna is damaged. It can still pick up a little bit of frequency, maybe less so, but still can pick up some stuff. The shack hack was a big hit. Ghost fans at home would make their own by going to Radio Shack, getting the same radio and modifying it based on, I guess, tutorials you'd see on YouTube. You could make your own shack hack and then head to your local haunted house and do some paranormal investigating the same way those guys on TV did. And thus the popularity of the spirit box. So the spirit box was kind of seen as a new evolution of EVP. A branching path from EVP. It's not the same. It's not just randomly uh, noises from the background. 
There's no idea that maybe that could be a real noise that's heard in the room that makes it onto a tape. It's just the idea of manipulation, that maybe something's manipulating the frequency, manipulating through electronic phenomena, technology-based kind of stuff. To me, the similarity is that you're interpreting static. You're interpreting background noise, this time aided by actual syllables and words from the radio waves, from the actual radio. So after the success of the Shack Hack, a dedicated spirit box was then released. This is called the SB7. It's essentially a cheaply made scan radio that doesn't need to be modified. You can take this one right out of the box, hit the button, and it will scan forward or backwards. It also has a light, where the screen lights up. It can go AM or FM. It has volume controls, and this one can control the sweep rate, which means you can scan slowly through the stations or quickly through the stations. It still has a linear scan. So there are a few ideas in the paranormal about how the spirit box works. Some people prefer just to leave it a mystery, to not think about how it works, and just use it. Some people would say that when this scans, the spirits are able to manipulate the radio waves and put their voice into it somehow. I do not accept that explanation. Another explanation that incorporates the idea that these are radio stations is that when it scans through, the spirits are able to manipulate what station it lands on. As I said, this is a linear scan. So that idea is kind of like Bumblebee from the movie Transformers, where he turns to a specific station just in time to hear a specific word that then has meaning as part of what he's communicating. That would be the paranormal picking the stations. It's a linear scan. It cannot do that. So the relatively more reasonable one would be the idea that the spirits are putting their voices onto it. I've heard words on this that I recognize from songs. I've heard words on this that I recognize as a radio host. These are radio broadcasts, and there's no evidence or way to prove that it's not a radio broadcast. But people could say, oh, this one quick word where it says yes, this one quick word where it says no, or where it says a name that sounds kind of similar to a name we're just discussing. That one, those are the spirits. There's no way to know that, and confirmation bias creeps in. When you say, what is your name? The next thing you hear which sounds remotely like a name, you're going to interpret that as the name. So to me, this is radio divination. This is static divination, the same as the EVP recorder. You're looking at randomness, the random scans of the radio, and interpreting those as a message. To me, that's perfectly spiritually valuable. That's perfectly valid if you're doing divination. I think it's more accurate to say this is a scan radio, working as intended, and you're using it for divination. You're listening to the words, interpreting those answers, and you could say in some fatalistic way that that's your answer, that that's the answer you're looking for, that that has some meaning or purpose to you. In the same way, shuffling tarot cards. Those are cards. They're working as intended. You're shuffling them. There's no manipulation going on. The spirits don't reach in and put this card in front of the other card. You're shuffling, and then the card that comes out is the card that you want, the card that you interpret to have meaning to you. When you throw the bones across the floor, the spirits don't come in and move the bones around where they're supposed to go. When you look at the clouds and you interpret symbols and signs in the clouds, most people don't believe that God or some spiritual being is moving the clouds around to the order you need them to be in. No. The tea leaves, when you drink from the cup and you look at the tea leaves and you interpret where they lay, the spirits don't come around and put them in the right order for you to see them in. I could go on and on, but essentially, the idea that the spirits are manipulating the device, I think is nonsense. This is a scan radio. It's working as intended, and you can use it for spiritual purposes. But don't insinuate that there's some kind of manipulation going on here. I'm very open to the idea that there might be some force of energy beyond the currently known electromagnetic spectrum that might have something to do with paranormal activity. I'm open to that idea, as hypothetical and unprovable as it may be. But the idea that the scan radio does anything more than scan, I think, is nonsense. So, I might have at first called it a broken radio, but I think the word to use is a scan radio. I think the way to see it is as divination. This is audio divination, static divination, radio divination, whatever you want to call it, it's divination. But you see the evolution from EVP recorders, first analog, then digital, then radio. And yes, sometimes, depending on where you are, you might need to put the antenna up so you can hear the spirits more clearly. So, I think we know what's going on here. And one thing I want to say is about the quality. I think the scan radio is more of a quality divination tool than EVP. Some people will criticize this device, but not criticize this device. 
because it's not an explicit, there's not something clearly being played. With this one, it's more obvious. We know it's a radio, so making radio noises is not very mysterious, but with this, the audio recorder, people assume that maybe there could be something in the room, or it, it makes more sense that a, an audio recorder could record something and pick something up that must have been some kind of manipulation. But just because something is less explicit in the fact that it's static noise, doesn't mean that it's therefore more legitimate. They're both gathering static and noise for you to then interpret in the words. But this one gets more responses. If we accept that this is just a radio scanning normally, and that this is audio divination, this is a better tool because it actually gives you syllables and words to work with and interpret. This one works better for the task of divination. And you'll notice, if you watch paranormal YouTube videos, People will often try first with an EVP recorder, and then when they get nothing, they'll pull out the spirit box. So if you accept that this is just an interpretation of static, I see no reason why you would use this as opposed to this. So despite this being a modified radio, it continued to be modified by paranormal investigators. This is a pedal box system. So what paranormal investigators decide to do, mostly on YouTube, but then also on TV, is to take pedal boxes which are these things that's used for guitars and music. They filter the radio through the pedal boxes and out to a mini amplifier. And they carry these things all around when they do their paranormal investigation and their haunted overnights. So the first one here is a noise killer. This essentially gets rid of background noise that isn't syllables, that isn't words. This cuts down the background noise, which is kind of against the original purpose, but now you hear only the syllables and the words. This next one is a reverb. It makes it sound more clear and also, I guess, more ghostly. This final one is an echo. What this does is it makes the sound repeat. So if you were to play a guitar through this, it would take that sound and play it again. But when you play a radio through it, it repeats the word or the syllable. So if you heard something that sounded like an answer, you'll hear that answer like three times over, and you can change the echo to be as many times as you want and kind of uh, adjust it there to fit to your liking. So essentially, you'll be able to hear that again. So if you heard a response and you weren't quite sure what it was, it'll play again. So it will be just the syllables, just the words, reverbed, and then play back again in an echo. So that's what this pedal box setup is. There are a bunch of different pedals you can buy and different setups you can have. But all of them go through the radio, through these pedals, and to an amplifier. And these are quite difficult to carry around in a haunted house, but people do it anyway, just as a way for their radios to sound a little bit better. So there are a few more ideas you could come up with on how to view the spirit box. One is a fatalistic idea. That you turn the radio on and hit play and hit stand at just the right moment that you picked up a word or a syllable that was meant for you to hear and for you to interpret as your answer, that the universe gave you that answer because you hit the button at the right time and you were meant to hit the button at the right time because of, you know, pre-existing factors. You wanted to go to a haunted house, you wanted to interact with the spiritual, you went there, you decided now is the time to do it, you hit the button right then, something in your mind told you, hit the button right now, see what you get, and therefore fatalistically, the answer came to you in that moment, and it's a message from the universe. You decided to ask that question, is anyone there? And you heard the yes right then. You decided, uh, what's your name? And you just so happened to get a word that came through that sounded like a name. Therefore, it's fatalistic. It's a fatalistic answer. Well, I think that's an interesting idea, but it leaves out confirmation bias. Because confirmation bias clearly influences the answers you're getting. The way you're interpreting it isn't just straight. You're not interpreting it just plain. You're interpreting it based on your questions, based on the answers that you want. So there's a little bit of influence there. The other way is synchronicity. You could say, well, what a coincidence, what a, a meaningful coincidence, what a synchronicity that I just so happened to hit this button and stand at that station just the right time that it gave an answer to a question that lined up with maybe the history of the place or lined up with the answer I was asking. And so therefore it's a synchronicity. Once again, confirmation bias kind of gets in the way of that. But if there was no confirmation bias present, if there was a way to remove that confirmation bias, then you could argue fatalism, you could argue synchronicity, and that would help greatly with audio divination. If there was no confirmation bias, you could say the answers are much more meaningful. Well, that's of course where I have to introduce
introduce the new way. This is a blindfold. These are noise-canceling headphones made for drummers. You can be wearing these and hitting the drums as hard as you can and not hear a thing. So these three items together are what's called the Estes Method. It comes from the Spirits of Stanley online miniseries. The way this works are that the headphones are plugged into the stand radio, one person wears the headphones and the blindfold, and the other person asks the questions. This way cuts down on the confirmation bias. The person who's wearing the headphones is solely tasked with interpreting the messages of the radio, with divining the syllables and the words into an answer, into a response. They can't hear the questions. They can't even read the lips of the reaction of the person asking the question. They can't see what's going on in the environment and answer to it. They are solely tasked with interpreting the audio. And that way, when the person asks a question and it lines up, it's more impressive, it's more meaningful. Though there still could be a little bit of confirmation bias in the fact that you know where you are. You know you're in a haunted house. You know they're going to be asking you questions. And so you could kind of interpret the, some of the words to be that. If you know the history of the place, that might creep in as well. So there's still a little bit of confirmation bias knowing where you are and what you're doing. But the one-to-one -one asking questions, giving answers, I say is more impressive using this method. Also, if you've watched Paranormal Entertainment, you're probably sick to death of listening to radio static, as you should be. I've met many paranormal investigators who I respect greatly, who seem almost addicted to radio static. And it's kind of interesting that they spend all their time listening to the static of the radio. The general audience doesn't want to listen to that. So with this, you just hear the response that the person verbalizes. They interpret the words, they say it out loud. And that way, there's a given interpretation. No one interpretation is more valid. You can't say this person's interpretation is more valid than this interpretation if we're talking about radio static. So, when you play the audio for the audience, the audience can reinterpret it. Well, you think it says this, I think it says that. And this is what you often come into conflict with when you're in a group of parallel investigators and they turn on that scan radio. People will say, I think it said this, I think it said that, well, I think it said this. And so, that conflict is completely erased by this method. He can't hear us, so we're going to take that interpretation as the answer, which is perfectly valid if it's considered divination. There's no value in one interpretation over another, so equally valid, so you could just take one person's interpretation. Any one interpretation is fine. And there's a method in parallel investigating, most present on TV, but also online, where people will flash up on screen the words they think the static sounds like. And when you see those words on screen, it makes you think that's what it said. So they're already guiding the way you interpret the static. Sometimes, what the words they put on screen sound nothing like the static coming through. So they're already attempting to interpret it for you. This way, it's interpreted and you don't have to listen to the static and you don't have to care about any of that. And you understand this is the interpretation of one person's interpretation of the radio. So I think it's a much more useful and spiritual way of doing it, a much more divination-focused way of doing it. And it reminds me greatly of seance practices. Back in the day, there would be, at a seance table, there would be one person who is the, the set person who's going to, you know, channel or do some kind of mediumship. And so, essentially, when you do the Estes method, you put on the blindfolds and the headphones, you become the trans medium. You become the leader of the seance table. You're answering the questions, but the fact that you're quite literally blinded and deafened makes it much more difficult for you to influence what's going on. We know that the spiritualists of the day, the seance practitioners, we know that some of them were tricksters and hoaxers and things like that. But when you have both of these on, it kind of blocks that out that this person was just there interpreting the static, kind of like a sound test that you do at a doctor's office. And so, essentially, that person becomes the seance leader, that person becomes the channeler, and the other person's asked the question, just like they did at the seance tables back in the day. So with the Estes method, what we're doing here is essentially radiostatic-aided seances, radiostatic-aided trance mediumship. Because when you're listening to the static of the radio with both of these on, it does become quite trance-like. You are sitting in the complete darkness with a blindfold on, and you're hearing nothing but complete static in both ears. It is essentially an electronically aided trance. You're going into a trance, and you're giving out answers. You're giving out the interpretations of the static. 
And so I think this is the best method. This is the way you should use a scan radio. If you're going to use a scan radio, this is the way to do it. It does require two people, though. If you're alone, you can use just a scan radio. But with the Estes method, you need two people. Kind of like the Ouija board, but you need two people. So I greatly respect the Estes method for bringing things back to the seance table style and for lining up perfectly with my view of the spirit box as a tool for audio divination. As I said, with EVP, people could fake it by recording their own audio and adding the noise in in post. The same with the radio. People could add in a specific sound from a radio or from a song and make that a response or edit it in such a way that the response comes at a different time. With the Estes method, you could have the headphones unplugged, or you could have a pre-written script or something like that. So, of course, no method is perfect, but if it's just you and your friends hanging out using this, chances are, nine times out of ten, there's not going to be much trickery going on, and it's just going to be you attempting to communicate. And sometimes you'll get good answers, and sometimes it will be a lot of nonsensical words that have nothing to do with what your question was. So, of course, results may vary, but I think it's the best method of using the scan radio. It makes it more cinematic as well, because it's two people essentially having a communication, one person sort of overshadowed or taken over by this radio, which is giving them the answers. It's instantly more dramatic, instantly more dynamic, it's instantly more seance feeling, like those old days when the person would go into a trance and they'd give you the answers. That's what it's like. This is the way for people to use technology to get answers that come from outside of them. And it can be very genuine if the person is sincerely trying to interpret it and it lines up. It's very impressive. It will make everyone freak out when the answer comes through and it's the same. Much better than having to listen to the noise of this thing in the room and have people argue over what did it say? Did it say this? Did it say that? Using this solo and out into the room is not only less dynamic, more annoying to the audience, but just, you know, it leads to a lot of bickering as to what it said. And it's just not as impressive. When this lines up, it's more impressive. So the Estes method, I think, the best method of using the scan radio. And it all goes back to the old tape recorders, to people trying to pick up voices on magnetic tape. Another thing to make note of is the SB11 Spirit Box, which is just a model of the scan radio with more complex options. It has the ability to dual scan which means it plays two different audio outputs of scanning through stations. This creates a soundscape which is just a mess of noise, once again illustrating that the purpose is simply to generate interpretable noise, regardless of how. It should also be said that a ghost team in Virginia coined what they called the double blind ghost box. A method of using the scan radios with headphones and a set interpreter. A book was published on the subject in 2013. This method is essentially an earlier version of the Estes method, lacking only the blindfold. So that's been sort of an overview of EVP and spirit box communication or scan radios. So if the paranormal is your game and hearing voices is your aim, then you can use the scan radios. And I think the best method of doing so is the Estes method. It's a form of divination. It's clearly interpretive. If you think that it's legitimate spiritual communication through manipulating of devices, I politely disagree. I think the way to use this is as divination. And just so my two cents is known, I do not consider any of these communications to be from dead people or from an afterlife. I do not believe in an afterlife, just so that's out there on the table. I am, however, a spiritual person, and I do leave open the possibility there could be spiritual communication going on with these tools and these devices. I just don't consider them to be dead people. I would consider them more spiritual beings and spiritual forces. Thanks for watching, and Mountaineers are always free.